everyone, it's Michelle, and welcome back to the Royal Daily Tea History and Fashion channel. Today we are doing the much-anticipated third episode of Karina and the King. But before we get into today's episode, I want everyone to know that this YouTube series is based on the podcast Karina and the King by Project Blazon. If you are interested, I have the links to the episodes in the description description where you can actually hear Karina telling her side of the story. But you guys, we have a lot of juicy stuff to talk about in today's episode. So you know what to do. Sit back and relax. Grab yourself a beverage. And let's get into Karina and the King. Now when we left off on the last episode, Karina had come back from her father's bedside where he had unfortunately passed away after a very lengthy illness, only to be told by King Juan Carlos, her lover for the past five years, a man who she trusted, a man who had recently asked for her hand in marriage, tells her nonchalantly that because she was not available, that he found someone else that he was actually carrying on an affair with another woman for the past three years. Now, something that's interesting about Karina, she's a woman who's independent. She has her own money. She owns several homes. She's traveled internationally for several years. So with her relationship with King Juan Carlos, she was not 100% in Madrid. She traveled back and forth between Switzerland, Monaco, England, and Madrid. So when she came back to Madrid to be by his side, looking for support and love from the man who had asked her dying father on his deathbed for his permission for her hand, for him to say, I have another woman because you weren't available for me, that really hurt Karina it had broken her trust. So at that point, we're in 2009, their relationship ends. However, they remain friends and she moves to Monaco to start her business where she starts working for the rich elites. Uh, she has connections to the palace in Monaco, works with Princess Charlene as an advisor. So she starts building her business, building her career, but she still remains very friendly with King Juan Carlos. So even though they were broken up and they were just friends, even though the king definitely wanted more, her trust was broken. But even though her trust was broken, she still remained friendly with the king, called him on a regular basis to see how he was doing, so much so that when her son Alexander turned 10 years old, she invited King Juan Carlos to her home in Switzerland to celebrate his birthday. Not only did she invite King Juan Carlos, she also invited her two ex-husbands to a party. She invited her husband, Prince Casimir, and her first husband, Philip, to a birthday party to celebrate her son's 10th birthday. Now, they all sat around the table. They all get along. It's one big happy family. And King Juan Carlos shows up at this party in Switzerland for her son, and he announces he has a surprise. He has decided he's going to gift her 10-year-old son, Alexander, a huge trip to an African safari. Now, Karina is a little taken aback because her son's only 10 years old. This is kind of a dangerous trip, and no one had run it by her that he would be presenting this huge gift to her son, unbeknownst to her. Now, one of the major concerns that Karina had was not only was this kind of an elaborate gift, it was a dangerous gift, but she was also afraid of sending mixed messages to King Juan Carlos. Now, even though they had technically parted ways and she was living in another country, they were still very much talking on the phone and he was trying to woo her back. But she knew he still had the other woman she couldn't trust him. He had really hurt her, and she didn't want to give him any ulterior motives or any ideas. You know, you give him an inch, she takes a mile. But he was 
kind of obsessed with her. You know, he still wanted to have Karina back. Now, this is a full three years after the incident happened. This is in 2012. But Karina still has her guard up around the king because once you hurt someone, they, you know, you lose your trust for them. You always have that in the back of your mind. So she didn't want to give the king the wrong idea by accepting this trip. But her son starts begging and begging and pleading with her, please, mommy, can we go on this trip? Please, mom, please, mom. And her ex-husband, Philip, who was an avid hunter himself, if you remember the story I told you on the last episode on her honeymoon, where he left her on the safari to go hunt, and she was stranded there, and that's where she learned to get involved with shooting and with guns. So Philip says, I'll come along with you. Now, according to Karina, her ex-husband, Philip, has a way of inviting himself to events. So finally, she gets worn down and she decides, okay, we'll go on this African safari. King Juan Carlos, herself, her 10-year-old son, Alexander, and her ex-husband, Philip Adkins. So she's thinking at this point, you know, what could go wrong? So they go out to this trip and she soon realizes when they fly out to Botswana that this was not really set up for a 10 year old safari. This was not a family trip, which she had envisioned for herself. Instead, it was a very luxurious setup. When you have the King of Spain traveling to a foreign country, you have to have security and assistance and butlers and staff. There was like 10 different, you know, uh, tents set up. There was tons of wine and food and cheese, a very, very glamorous camp, kind of a glamping situation. So she started to panic a little, realizing that maybe she made a mistake. Was the king going to be on his best behavior? But again, she had her ex-husband. She was sleeping in a tent with her son. But she kind of knew that Juan Carlos was going to be partying and drinking and, you know, trying to woo her back. And it definitely wasn't the safari that she kind of had in mind as a birthday gift to her son. So she kind of felt like she was duped to attend this very glamorous glamping trip with the king. Now, of course, this was an extremely expensive trip to the tune of $60,000. And we all know King Juan Carlos definitely is the type of man who loves luxury, but what he loves even more is spending other people's money. He doesn't like to do anything himself. So this trip, was definitely paid for by someone else. This trip was organized and paid for by a Syrian businessman and a close trusted advisor for the Saudi Arabian king by the name of Mohammed Iyad Kalai. Now it's interesting how the king of Spain goes on a very luxurious trip paid for by someone else. So obviously this type of trip has to be kept top secret and out of the public eye. Remember, everyone thinks the royal family is living off that little $9 million a year, and they don't know that King Juan Carlos is receiving boatloads of money and gifts and cars and boats, living a very luxurious lifestyle behind closed doors. So the public has one image of their king, but the king is actually living a very luxurious life on the dime of other people from other countries that the public is not aware of. So when Karina gets there, she realizes that this is kind of a dangerous trip for a 10 year old boy. They were there to hunt elephants, even though some people had considered elephants to be endangered species, the government of Botswana arranges for a very select few to get a hunting license every year because they say it's necessary because too many elephants can be dangerous. They stomp water pumps and trample crops. And of course, it's a very lucrative business for the government. So these big hunters like King Juan Carlos pay tens of thousands of dollars to shoot elephants to get the trophy of the tusk. 
But Karina decided this was not what she wanted for her son to be around this huge, you know, trophy hunt. Karina realizes very quickly that for her 10 year old boy, this is very dangerous. And so she arranges more of a PG version of the safari where every single morning her and her son go up in a helicopter. They have little picnics, they have little exploring trips of the wilderness where they visit the plains and the marshes. Uh, they get to see hippos and giant crocodiles, but they're definitely staying away from the hunting of the elephant part of the trip. So Karina goes to bed early with her son Alexander. He was very hot. They did a lot of walking. They're very tired. But she notices that King Juan Carlos is definitely up in one of his moods. He's drinking, smoking, talking, you know, entertaining people. And she knows he's going to be up for a late night of drinking. Now you have to remember King Juan Carlos is in his 70s. He's not a young man. And he's out in this safari in Botswana, which is kind of a dangerous safari it's hot you're walking around there's guns there's you know hunting of these elephants he's up all night drinking you know it's kind of a recipe for disaster well the next morning she realizes that something's off and she sees Juan Carlos's chief of security Vicente Machales Gutierrez and he tells Karina that the king won't be going out that day um, that he had fallen and hurt himself. Now, when she went into King Juan Carlos's room, he was laying in bed having a breakfast, you know, fit for a king with bacon, eggs, orange juice, and coffee. You know, what Karina calls his post late night big wine drinking breakfast. So she asked the king if he's okay. He says they're fine. So Karina and her son, you know, they head out to the helicopter. They're about to take off for another trip when all of a sudden she sees the head of the king's security frantically waving for her to land the helicopter. So they land the helicopter, she runs out there, and she finds out that the king is really, really hurt. Now, even though it had been only 15 minutes since she had seen the king, apparently a medical team had been called, and they believed that the king was suffering from internal bleeding, and they had to get him to a hospital immediately. Now, when she asked King Juan Carlos what had happened, he said during the night, he got out of bed. Of course, he was a little drunk. He was trying to find his way to the bathroom. He tripped and fell and hurt himself, but he did not realize the amount of his injuries. So now they have a little bit of a problem. You have the King of Spain who hurt himself on a foreign trip to Botswana that no one knows that he's at. So now, they're all freaking out. You know, they have the King of Spain who needs to go to the hospital ASAP. He has a major injury. He's in his 70s. He has internal bleeding. But they got to get him out of Botswana. But the other problem is people don't know he's in Botswana. So they got to do it secretly. But they tell Karina, we have to get him, get him out of here immediately. We don't have time to get the, the state plane. We have to use your private jet the one that you chartered. We're going to have to, you know, take the king on your plane because we have to leave immediately. So now they go on Karina's plane and they're flying home. And this is like a 10 hour flight from Botswana where they're at to Spain. And then she starts to panic. Like what happens if he dies? What happens if she's on a private plane with the king of Spain and he dies in the air? I mean, could you imagine? How do you explain that? So apparently they have him hooked up to an IV. He's getting prepped for surgery. He's going to be rushed into emergency surgery when they land. And she's being told by the, one of the airline stewardesses that the king is demanding wine. Yeah, he's demanding wine and they, they don't know how to say no to the king. And she tells him, you know, Carlos, you're about to have surgery. You can't have wine. And he starts complaining, says, I am the king and I can do what I want. So Karina goes up to his head of security and he's like, give him the wine. But then Karina starts to think, you know, why are they insisting on my private plane? What happens if he died on the plane? This is very bad protocol. They should have had a government plane take him out ASAP. They try to tell her, oh, it won't be here in time, etc., etc. But then she starts to realize that they're trying to hide. They're trying to hide the king from the public. It doesn't look good to have the king on a very expensive hunting trip. And of course, they didn't want to tell his wife. So 
they're trying to get him into the country in a little secretive way right she just does what they tell her to do so king juan carlos goes to the hospital he immediately goes through emergency surgery and her and her son check themselves into a five-star hotel it's after midnight they're exhausted they hadn't even packed their clothing they're both wearing their camouflage outfits that they were going to wear for that day on the outing she only had enough time to take her passport and her credit card but they're exhausted so they land so she goes to the hotel and they fall asleep. So when Karina wakes up the next morning, it's a new Spain. The king has fallen, not only from his trip in Botswana, but he is no longer the national hero. A huge royal scandal has now broken all over the press. The man who restored democracy to Spain, the hero of Spain, is no longer considered a hero. Now there's stories that their king was hurt in Botswana while he was shooting elephants with a blonde lover, a foreign lover, and this was the story of the century. Now the royal household was holding off on saying anything in regards to the king and why he was in Botswana because they were already dealing with their own personal crisis. So a few days before King Juan Carlos had left for Botswana for his safari hunting trip, his 13 year old grandson, Felipe Juan Ferlan, the son of his daughter Elena, had accidentally shot himself in the right foot when he was doing target practice at his family estate in Madrid. So his family was all by his side, including his wife, Queen Sophia. The whole family was there except for Juan Carlos. And everyone was wondering, well, where is the king? Why is he not at the bedside of his grandson? Now, there was a new director of communications who had just started working for the palace by the name of Javier Ayuso. And this man was freaking out because now he had to explain where was the king, why was he not at the side of his family with his grandson, and why was he in Botswana? That's a big problem. And the, the press was just everywhere. They were all over the lobby of the hospital. People wanted answers. So Javier and the king they had all realized he got caught with his pants down. Somehow word gets out that the king was hunting elephants in Botswana. So an old picture from an old hunting trip dated back to 2006 gets printed with the king sitting in front of a dead elephant. People are pissed. This does not look good. So things are starting to spin out of control. It becomes abundantly clear that the king had an extramarital relationship with another woman. He's flying around on private jets and he's killing elephants. Clearly not the king that people thought he was. So following his surgery, there's a huge article that gets published in a huge magazine saying the story of how the crown has gone into a tailspin printed in fifth paragraph is Karina's full name. It reads the king's intimate friendship with Karina Zuzan Wittgenstein Zahn is no longer a rumor but a certainty. So now Karina realizes that the whole world knows who she is and now her name is printed in the paper. So not only is the king of Spain hurt on this extravagant hunting trip but now he's pictured with a leggy blonde his mistress and a foreigner to boot now by the end of the day the newspapers across the country are printing the name karina 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 everyone now knows who karina is even though she's no longer with the king it's been three years since their breakup the story has broken and everyone knows who this blonde, leggy foreigner is. And let's just say the Spanish public was not pleased. Now, many people are very angry at the fact that the king is off on this, you know, trip where he's killing Dumbo. He's killing little elephants, not to mention his 13 year old grandson is laying in his bed his grandfather wasn't there instead he's traipsing around botswana with this blonde 
and the timing couldn't be worse as the Spanish economy was one of the worst in history where one in four Spaniards were out of work and only a month before the king had made a television appearance where he talked about how he was so concerned about the youth unemployment which was nearly 50 percent was keeping him up at night but yet somehow he goes on this very expensive trip that cost sixty thousand dollars with a blonde who's not his wife and now they know that the king has to give a speech. He has to explain himself to the public. He has to show some kind of remorse for his actions. So they decide that King Juan Carlos is going to give a 10 worded speech and he's going to try to come out and, and look sincere. He limps out in a suit and crutches and he looks up at the camera and he says, I'm very sorry. I made a mistake. And it won't happen again so in a lot of people's opinion this was the beginning of the end of king juan carlos so at this point karina's name is all over the press and they're naming her the witch everything is her fault who is this blonde foreigner who brought her king down took him to botswana where he got hurt he wasn't with his wife he wasn't with his grandson spain's economy's in the toilet she's an evil woman she's an elephant killer it's all her fault so now karina is starting to experience all of this paparazzi backlash you know her hotel is being barraged with paparazzi her family her friends her associates her business assistants her offices the phones are ringing off the hook and she doesn't know what to do for the first time in her life she's freaking out and this is three years after they had broken up but now she really suspects that queen sophia might be behind the leaking of this story she believes that queen sophia still has it in for her and when queen sophia found out that karina was with her husband in botswana well she believes that karina is still trying to destroy her reputation and that is how the press got her name now they've never been able to prove that but karina believes that queen sophia and queen sophia's team leaked her information to the press so Karina, you know, leaves Monaco because she's being harassed by the journalists, TV crews everywhere. Her family's being called. Her friends are being called. Her mother's being called. Her associates are being called. Her assistants are being called. It is just crazy. She's being hounded and blasted in the press as an evil witch. So she flees to London to meet with her team. But while she's there, she receives this very weird phone call from a company who say that they're a security firm by the name of Algez and they say they've been hired by quote her friends in Madrid and they're there to now provide her with the necessary security so now she's freaking out like who are you talking about what friend in Madrid so she assumes it's the king she calls the king and she wants to know what is happening who are these people and he, he informs her that basically uh, she needs extra security in place to be protected from the paparazzi she starts receiving word from her assistants and housekeepers that this quote new security ascends upon her apartments her offices demanding keys and basically they're occupying her premises so that's not providing her security they're just commandeering her personal property so now she's freaking out she calls the king and she's like it's illegal what you're doing I'm in another country. I'm an individual. You can't just go to my office or my homes and commandeer them, have people going through my things and say it's quote for my security. You're not doing anything about the paparazzi, but you're just taking over my apartment. You're taking over my businesses like you're not helping. Now the king tells her that everything will be fine, that this is just a precaution for her safety, but she's in a total state of anxiety. She's a very private person. She feels very, very exposed. People are going through her papers. They're calling her associates, her clients, anyone who knows her now. They are literally combing through her background and it's leaving her completely terrified and exposed. Now, the king is acting a little blasé about the whole thing, like he just kind of brushes it off, like it's no big deal. 
But she's really, really worried about these, you know, reporters. And there's one in particular by the name of Daniel Lopez Canales, who is really hell bent on finding out every detail about Karina. And he made it his mission to expose. Karina and the King and their relationship. And he was definitely digging into her background, calling her friends, her associates. Well, word got out to her that this man's digging in your past. So she calls the King and lets him know you need to get rid of this man. He is threatening me. He's, you know, going into my background. So the reporter gets a mysterious phone call from the CNI which is Spain's version of the CIA or FBI. And they pretty much let him know that uh, a very important man in Spain doesn't like you uh, looking into the background of his friend, a female friend. So he knows really well, it's the king. They're telling him to be very careful what he publishes, but he just laughs it off like, okay, uh, I'll take what you say, but I'm going to keep going. So now Karina is definitely trying to take her mind off of these people who are vilifying her, blaming her in the press. She's at work and she has a very important overseas business trip coming up. And so she decides to check into one of her favorite hotels in London, the Connaught. Now the Connaught is a very a uh, high level resort, but it's like a family atmosphere. Everyone knows her because she goes there quite often. Um, so she decides to step in there at the hotel. Now, as she's there, she meets with her ex-husband, Philip, the one who accompanied them on that trip to Botswana. And he tells her that a couple of days before his car was broken into. So she does suspect it might be the paparazzi. It could be that security team that supposed to be protecting her, but yet is taking over all of her apartments and offices, not really protecting her. So she's really paranoid, but she has to go on this trip. So that night, Karina is very stressed out and she's not sleeping well. She's tossing and turning. She's always been a light sleeper. You know, she's very stressed out, but she has to um, get a good night's sleep because she has to fly out the next morning for her business trip. So she calls the hotel, asks them, you know, for a wake up call. She pops the sleeping pill and off she goes. So eventually in the middle of the night, she's woken up to see this shadowy figure at the end of her bed. And she finally says, who are you? What are you doing here? And he says, I'm sorry, but I'm here to help you pack. And then leaves the room like it was nothing. So immediately Karina reaches for the phone and she dials reception. You know, no one has ever come to her room to help her pack. And it's like, three in the morning. Why would anyone check out at that time? The hotel staff insist it was an honest mistake and he was really there to help her pack. But she felt like people who had raided her apartment are now surveilling her. She feels like she's being followed. So now she's getting ready for this business trip. She, she wants to cancel, but she realizes it's very, very important for her to maintain her business routine, to keep calm and carry on in a professional attitude. So she travels to Brazil as planned. And then one night when she's in Rio, when she's on her way up to see the statue of the Christ Redeemer, she starts to get paranoid again. She feels like, you know, is somebody following me? Now she's in a car with one of her friends and they're going up these very windy and slippery roads. And then she notices the car and they're telling them their headlights are flashing in the rear view mirror. So she tells her friend, speed up, speed up. He hits the pedal, swerving around the sharp bends. The cars are getting closer, but eventually, you know, they're able to lose this car before they're almost run off the road. So at this point, it's becoming very clear to her that she is no longer safe. Somebody is out to get her, but she doesn't know who and she doesn't know why. She's supposed to have this quote security company that are supposed to provide security for her, but she's not safe. They're not fighting off the paparazzi. There's cars following her. She was almost run off the road. People have taken over her apartments and office buildings, yet the phone is still ringing off the hook. She's still being harassed. And the king is acting like, eh, it's not a big deal, relax, you're fine. But Karina is anything but fine. And she's starting to realize that she's now in a very dangerous situation. So as Karina makes her way back to London to the Connaught Hotel, she receives a word from King Juan Carlos 
that she's going to have someone pay her a visit. Now she's a little nervous, like who's, who's coming to visit her and why? His name is Felix Sanz Rodon. He is General Sanz Rodon, the head of the Spanish Secret Service, kind of Spain's answer to MI6, among the most country's most powerful men. So now she begins to suspect that this man is the one who uh, tailed her in Brazil, the one who uh, had the break-ins, the spies. He's been watching her the entire time. She had met him once before, uh, about a month before the trip to Botswana at a dinner with the king, and she got a very bad vibe from this man. She felt like he was sizing her up, and now she believes he's responsible for everything that's happening to her, that, quote, security, the surveillance, the break-ins, and the cartel in Brazil, that this man has definitely been watching Karina for some time. Now, she thinks that they're going to meet at the lobby of the hotel and have a cup of coffee, but no, the general decides he's going to meet Karina in her hotel room, which is a little too intimate for Karina. As she's having this awkward, intimate exchange with this man who's very scary, so this man, Mr. Rodon, tells Karina in no uncertain terms that, you know, for her to be the mistress of the king, it's a great honor and that it is now her responsibility to keep the king motivated to stay in his job. And because the king had become very weakened by his latest medical intervention, he was ready to throw in the towel, and they needed to keep him on the throne. Now she's looking at him like, are you crazy? Like, I'm done with this. I, I don't want to, we're not even together. We've been broken up for three years. And, and here's the head of Secret Service in her hotel room telling her it is her job to keep her ex-lover ex-boyfriend motivated to stay on the throne. Now what does that say about the state of affairs in the royal family and the royal palace and the government in regards to secret service talking to the king's former mistress? So this is crazy and he's looking at her saying well you know the fate of the Spanish crown depends on you, depends on Karina that uh, she keeps the king happy so he could do his job. And it wasn't a request, it's a threat. He tells her in no uncertain terms, you are not to talk to the media under any circumstances. We write your script, no matter what it is, you just have to take whatever lies we put out there. And he said, unless you basically comply with these instructions, I cannot guarantee this personal or physical safety of your children. So now Karina understands these people mean business and she knows they can deliver on those threats. So after he leaves, Karina is now freaking out. Like she's just trying to go back to live her normal life. She's being slammed in the press. She's being followed. There's people in her businesses talking to her associates. And now the head of the secret service is telling her it is her responsibility to keep the king happy, who was her ex-boyfriend, to keep him motivated to be on the throne or they can't be responsible or guarantee the safety of her children. And the king knew 100% that this man was going to visit her. Was he behind this? As we mentioned before, Juan Carlos was trying to get Karina back and she wasn't biting, but now he's kind of forcing her hand. Now this is the very first time that Karina started to see the real monster, the real monster behind the man that is King Juan Carlos, because King Juan Carlos sent the head of Secret Service to deliver this message to Karina. Keep your mouth shut, do what we say, and by the way, make the king happy, do everything he wants, and everything will be fine. So for the very first time in their entire relationship, he is now controlling her. He was never able to control or contain her before, but he's certainly going to do it now. So after that meeting at the Connaught Hotel, Karina decides to fly to her home in Switzerland and she goes into her home and quickly realizes someone had been in her home. Things were moved around, papers were shuffled, things were out of place. And on her coffee table, she notices a book. Now as she slowly approaches, she sees the cover and she catches her breath. It's a picture of Princess Diana. Now, the book was a book that accused the British Secret Service 
of having caused her death. It was a book about the conspiracy of her death. So basically, here she's visited by the head of the Spanish Secret Service. She flies to Switzerland and finds a book on her coffee table that's not hers. That's a book about the conspiracy theory that the British Secret Service murdered Princess Diana. So it's very loud and clear that uh, King Juan Carlos and his henchmen, General Sans Rodan, have long-reaching arms all over the world and that Karina cannot escape. So that night when she's at her home, she starts locking all the doors, checking the windows. She's extremely paranoid. She feels like there's cameras in her home and her phone buzzes and all of a sudden she gets this weird person on the phone and he says, there are many tunnels between Monaco and Nice. And if you know, Princess Diana died in a car crash in a tunnel in Paris. So now she knows if you don't obey these instructions, your physical safety is at risk. So Karina starts to become very, very depressed. She starts to feel very hopeless, very isolated, and very disappointed that King Juan Carlos is not the man that she thought he was. She starts to see the mass manipulator and the monster that he really is, that a man who was raised by a dictator is, I guess, one apple that didn't fall far from the tree. So two months after this trip in Botswana happened in 2012, Karina receives a very interesting phone call from the king's lawyer. And he says to her, he is a partner at a Swiss law firm, and he's responsible for managing the finances of the king. And he asks her if they can talk in person, and he speaks of a gift. Now, she's very intrigued. So she flies to Switzerland, and Kanaka starts out vaguely by talking about an inheritance for Karina and her son, Alexander. Now, nothing is surprising as this conversation, as the king and Karina had had many of conversations about him providing for her son, Alexander. Remember, he was very, very close to her son. So he had talked of a will more and more, you know, as he was getting older and as his health declines. So, you know, he kind of just started talking about normal things. Now, Karina was not a gold digger. She was a woman who came from money. Uh, she made her own career. She was very successful. She said oftentimes when she would go out with the king, she would pick up the check because again, he doesn't like to spend his own money. So she was a very independent woman, never in one place, owned several homes on her own. So she wasn't looking for anything in particular when it came to a monetary gift. But we all know that the king had a very big reputation and he was very, very generous to the women he courted over the years. So as he calculated in his mind that Alexander and her should receive equivalent of an amount that would be not inferior or far inferior to what the other women received, kind of like a compensation. She said it felt like almost a divorce settlement that he was compensating her for the problems that she'd had over the last couple of months, being slammed in the press, being harassed. You have to remember they had been broken up for three years at this point, but they were together for five years. So a settlement of 65 million euros that they called a donation. So the money was transferred from a secret account in Switzerland that was owned by a Panama foundation. So none of this was basically, you know, traced or could be tracked back to the king. It's all through these shell companies, very intricate financial system that they had going on. Because again, the king was always having boatloads of cash that weren't tied to him, that weren't tied to the government. We all know the background. Now the money was very tempting, but Karina was like, what's the catch? There's gotta be a catch, especially with Juan Carlos. You don't just give someone 65 million euros and say, thank you, peace out. I mean, remember, she was threatened by the head of secret service to keep the king happy. He had his eyes on her. He was controlling her every move, something he had not done before, but now he was controlling her. And now he's just generously giving her 65 million euros just because there's obviously a catch. So he tells her, nope, there's no catch. 
Um, you know, he, he felt that people in the press were being unfair to you. And, you know, here's some payment. And, you know, they just want to give you some kind of payment, you know, to keep you quiet. Now, the king's lawyer reassures her the contracts, the agreements are all signed and by the king himself. This is just a gift. It is a 65 million euro gift with no strings attached. Now, again, people like Juan Carlos don't throw money out like that for no reason. But you know what? She gets on the next flight to Spain and insists on meeting the king to ask him a single question are you looking for something in return? And he says, no, not at all. So he said he felt bad for everything she was going through, her reputation, her business. I mean, she lost most of her business and her clients due to the scandal. So she felt like, okay, she was justified and she accepted the money. But as we said before, no good deed goes unpunished. And there's a huge price to pay for accepting a gift of that size because someone needs to take the fall. So now she suddenly realizes that she was framed for this whole Botswana trip and now they might be setting her up to be framed for something that she has absolutely nothing to do with. So is Karina being set up to take the fall for something much more sinister. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Karina and the King. Stay tuned for Karina and the King episode four. If you'd like to check out the podcast, the link will be down in the description as well as all of my other social media accounts. As always, I appreciate you being here and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye guys.